evolution, only members of the same species can reproduce successfully, pass on their genes to the next generation. If the next generation has advantageous genes from their parents, then they can reproduce and pass on their genes. So we're going to look a little bit about this idea of species and what makes something a species. In evolution, we call it a reproductively isolated set of organisms or group of organisms. Reproductive isolation means that you can only reproduce successfully, meaning that you have offspring who also are fertile and can have offspring. You certainly could do the act of mating or sex with many different species, right? I mean, I hope you're not, but um, you can, but will having sex with a chimpanzee result in fertile offspring? No, right? Okay, good. All right, so fertile offspring, really, really, really important in the concept of evolution. So I know that we have said that evolution is a product of what happens in a population but as individuals, just to see those fertile offspring is important. These two fish, even though they look a lot alike, they are different species, which means even if they look alike and they mate, it does not mean they will have fertile offspring. They have to be the same species. So that idea of reproductive isolation, you can only mate with members of your own species successfully to have fertile offspring. So we have different levels of reproductive isolation. We're going to take a look at those and the factors that say, well, they probably won't mate because of this, that, and the other. So reproductive isolation means that two groups have the inability to mate or do the act of sex together. And we'll talk about all the different reasons why. So here's a big idea too, is that if evolution is important that two individuals have offspring that are fertile and can also have offspring, is it a good idea to waste a lot of your energy seeking out members of different species to mate with? Not in terms of evolution. The big thing again is that only members of the species can have fertile offspring contribute in a positive way to evolution in the next generation. So we're going to look at first the pre-mating mechanisms. These are things that happen to prevent the act of sex from occurring. So we're going to take a look at all of these and talk about the characteristics behind them that prevent different species from possibly mating. So we're going to start with the geographical isolation. So here is just, you know, based on geography, you don't live in the same place at the same time. If you physically can't get together, you can't physically have offspring. So even if you think there's a fish that lives in the Philippines and you're like, that is so pretty, I want to mate with that. Can you mate with them? No, right? So you don't live together, so you can't do it. So you don't even waste your time. That's nice. So just like the fish I showed you earlier, those fish live in the same place at the same time. Nothing can happen because they're not the same species. But with geographical isolation, if there's two turtles, one turtle lives on the mountain, the other one lives down at the bottom of the mountain. If they're not good climbers, they're never going to get together. So they're never going to mate. So they are geographically isolated from one another. Ecological isolation. This one's a little bit strange in that 
the species do live in the same place at the same time, but they just don't do the same kinds of things. So there's 750 species of fig wasps. Each of those wasps specifically pollinates a type of fig. So if you're going to the fig tree where the figs are brown, and there's another wasp, and it's going to the fig tree where the figs are red, and that's the only places that you go all day, will you ever meet up, even though you live in the same neighborhood? Nope. So ecological isolation just means that you do different things for different reasons and you never meet up. I'm sure you guys have experienced this where you're, you go to class and you're sitting next to a person, you talk to each other and you say, oh, what's your name? Oh, okay, blah, blah, where do you live? Wait, you live on that block? So do I. I've never seen you before, right? Or you've gone to the same high school or something or you go to the same gym and you just never have like seen each other because maybe you do one thing at the gym and they do another thing at the gym and so you just never cross paths before. Temporal isolation. Temporal is time. As a species, if you mate at a certain time of the year, let's say you're like, I love to mate in the spring. I like when everything starts growing. That's my mating time. There's another species, they only mate in the fall. You are never gonna mate because you guys never mate at the same time. So again, temporal, remember this is time. You don't mate at the same time. Could be night and day. So it could be as simple as that, could be different seasons, different months. Behavioral isolation. This one is probably my favorite. A lot of, especially animals, do specific behaviors to attract a mate. And it's usually with animals, it's the male does some kind of dance or show to attract the female. So if the male's doing this dance and the female's like, ew, that's weird, she's not gonna mate with that. Different species have different mating dances. So if you're different species and they're doing something and you're like, that's super weird, you probably won't mate with them, not only as an individual, but the whole species. You're gonna be like, that species is weird. I don't wanna mate with them. So these behaviors, the mating behaviors, if two different species are doing different things that are attractive, you're not going to mate with them. If you just wanna, if you're like super into nature, which I know a lot of you are, and you wanna just laugh, go on YouTube and put in animal mating behaviors, and you'll see all kinds of videos. I'm gonna show you a couple, but they're so funny. Okay, so I'll give you a couple. And then did the big dance and the call, and she still didn't get it. I don't know what the sound is so bad. Customize and save. Mating ritual is not sexy, right? Okay, so those are just some behavioral isolation mechanisms. Mechanical means that the parts just don't fit. 
So why you're not going to find a teeny little spider monkey mating with an elephant? So all five of those isolation mechanisms are going to prevent the act of mating from happening. There's going to be other levels that let's say that timing is good and they're in the same place and they get the behaviors and the parts fit, they could potentially mate or try to mate with another individual of a different species. So we have what are called post mating mechanisms where things go wrong. Different levels mean that there's going to be different problems with the organisms that are produced. And we're going to take a look at three different levels of issues. So first thing are the gametes, that there's issues with the gametes, meaning that the sperm and the egg coming together, there are issues with them. So again, let's say that they do the act of mating, but then Nothing ever comes of the offspring. So one of the things that happens is that when you take a look at our cells in any given organism, the cells have all kinds of different things that are sticking off of them that identify what kind of cell they are. One of the identifiers is called MHCs or major histocompatibility complexes. And these MHCs have to fit together. So with species two, you can see that the shape of this species sperm matches the shape of this egg's MHC. This one, even if this one tried, they wouldn't fit very well. So that wouldn't work because of the MHCs. So they just have to be similar and even down to the cellular level of structure in order for them to make a successful mating of sperm and egg or pairing of sperm and egg. So that's one issue. So the other issue can be related to the number of chromosomes that the sperm and egg have. So here, for any given species, they have a specific chromosome number. So with this, 30 would tell us that the chromosome number for the species is 60, because 30 from the egg and 30 from the sperm would give you a total chromosome number of 60. This one tells us that the chromosome number for the species is 64. Let's say these two try and mate, and what happens is, is that when that sperm goes to fertilize this egg, who's got a smaller species number, and you end up with so end up with 62, but really ideal for the species and the species number is 60, that this probably won't come to be a viable offspring because if you have even just a little bit of extra DNA in a species, it produces extra protein. And while you might think, well, that's great, extra protein is good, right? No, it's not good. That species 
need to stick to their species number because in genetics, too much or too little DNA in your offspring can be disastrous for the development. So having two complete extra chromosomes, probably really bad. So either the sperm and egg can't bind together or the species number doesn't work out to the same, and then you have issues. So that could be either the gametes or it can work for hybrid inviability. That for some reason, the hybrid or the offspring is unable to survive. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have that on your notes, huh? It looks like you need to write this down, I'm sorry. This sometimes happens with species of frogs who are really close in genetic number, or maybe even they're the same species genetic number. So you might have two different species and they both have, let's say, 60 total chromosomes, but does it mean that two different species, all 60 of those chromosomes are exactly the same? No, it doesn't mean that. So you might get with um, some species is that the offspring might survive for a couple days and then they die off. So in some cases, you do get offspring that are born, but they die quickly. Can what? Could, and we'll get to that, yeah. So sometimes they can get really close, and the chromosomes are really close, and we'll, we'll get there. Good question, Andre. So sometimes this is what can cause maybe like a spontaneous abortion or miscarriage in some species. And so here I give you the example, the frogs, the leopard frog and the wood frog. This is what would happen with them, that their offspring might survive a few days and then that's it. Okay, then the next level is hybrid infertility. So this one, you do get an offspring, they're born. The chromosomes are super duper close. Make a living, successful offspring in terms of being alive, but not successfully able to reproduce in the future. So you can't get that close. Occasionally, on occasion, they might merge into the same species, but that's um, not very common. Oh, sorry. So one example that you might know of horses and donkeys, they mate together. They can make a mule, and the mule will live, but the mule is sterile or infertile. So mules can't have more mules. You have to mate another horse and another donkey to get another mule. And if you've heard of like the ligon and the tigon, it's mating of tigers and lions. Um, and I think it's the ligon is the male lion and the female tiger, and the tigon is the male tiger and the female lion. But those offspring are not successful in terms of being able to mate, but they do live. Okay, actually, let's, um, let's stop there and head down the lab. <laughs>